going to begin scripture reading in Genesis chapter 6, if you want to turn there. Last week, I dealt with lessons from the flood. This week, I aim to address lessons from Noah's ark. I am very much aware of my limitations when attempting to speak scientifically, which is why I don't really like to speak scientifically. I also have limitations when speaking theologically, but I do like to speak theologically. I just know that there are questions that I don't have all the answers to. And, or at least answers that are going to satisfy everyone. And so I realize there are times where we address things that leave some holes or leave some spots of uncertainty. I'm aware of that. And so my goal is not to try to answer every angle, every thought that uh, might come to your mind or mine this morning. And in fact, hopefully some of the things you'll hear today will just stir up further conversation among you and seeking further answers. But properly understood, the Bible does not contradict empirical scientific discovery. Properly understood. The Bible does record historical events and prophecy of future events that are beyond the reach of observable science. Example, creation. There was only one person who was there, so it's not observable to us. So we have to take the witness of he who was there who said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if you have a problem with that, you're going to have a problem with a lot of the Bible. But once you get that settled, much of the rest of the Bible just unfolds to you. The virgin birth. <laughs> Prove that one. The resurrection. Heaven. Hell. You see, we have a problem if we only believe that which can be proven by empirical scientific discovery. There are some things that can't be proven that way. And the flood is one of those that doesn't as clearly fall into that category, but does to some degree. And I say it doesn't as clearly fall into that category because there are uh, scientific discoveries that are answered by the flood. In fact, the flood helps us to make sense of some of the things that we do discover in science. And so having said those things, let me just read the scriptures and then we'll continue our, our thoughts. Uh, Genesis 6 and verse 14 Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark. And the word rooms there is, you know, it's not, you know, we all, you may be thinking bedroom. You don't think of rooms that way. It could be a number of things, including, uh, we just saw the, the replica of the ark up in Kentucky. Kentucky and I know the Davises just came from there and it's kind of helpful to see the way they have put that together and you see that rooms aren't like your bedroom uh, it's it's a space it, it, in fact the Hebrew word can even be ref can refer to something like a nest or just a, a resting place uh, a place that is occupied and shall pitch it within and without with pitch and this is the fashion which, with which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third story shalt thou make it. And behold, 
I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven. And everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, two of every sort, shalt thou bring into the ark to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female. I'm not going to make much of that, but that's a pretty big deal right there. Especially to this modern world. <laughs> male and female. Why? It's for the sustaining of life. Male and female. Pretty basic. Of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind, a significant expression after his kind, which tracks back to Genesis chapter 1, which is exactly what God said he did in creation. A lot of the same language is used, in fact, in Genesis 6 and 7, as was used in the first chapter. Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee. It shall be for food for thee and for them. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. Verse 7. And for sake of time, I'm skipping around a bit. Verse 7. And Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood verse 11 in the 600th year of Noah's life in the second month the 17th day of the month isn't it interesting how precise it's recorded if this was just mythological or some fairy tale there wouldn't be so so many details and dates like are given I mean there there is literature, genre of literature in the scripture that we do understand figuratively, but they're not written like this. The same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the selfsame day entered Noah, and Shem, and Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Ham, and Noah's wife, and the three wives of his sons with him, into the ark. They and every beast of after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, of every bird of every sort. And they went in into the ark. Excuse me. They went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Verse 23, And every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground, both man and cattle, and the creeping things, and the fowl of the heaven, and they were destroyed from the earth. And Noah only remained alive, and they that were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed upon the earth 150 days. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And then chapter 8 and verse 20, this phrase, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord. You can turn over to 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to read from there in a few moments. The biblical record of the cataclysmic worldwide flood occurring over 4,000 years ago is an event that is scoffed at by many. Questions are asked that are difficult to answer to the satisfaction of unbelieving minds. Even some professing Christian thinkers refuse to accept the biblical record at face value. These are astonishing words that I'm about to read. They come from a man who professes to be a Christian who was a former vice president of a, a, vice president of a group called Biologos. 
Listen to these words. Written in 2016. And this is written in response to the ark that was just, uh, the replica that was just built up in Kentucky. He's responding to what Ken Ham is doing up there. Even if we assume that all adults not sired by Noah were terrible sinners deserving to be drowned, the collateral damage in the deaths of innocent children, innocent children, and animals dwarfs every major genocide in history combined. If Noah's story is literally true, God is a monster. I hesitate to even read those words. This is what he wrote, though. I doubt God helped Ham with his project to establish this. Talking about Ken Ham. In convincing people that Noah's flood was a historical event, Ham has done a great disservice to Christianity and thinking people in general. For if Ham is right, almost all of contemporary science, biblical scholarship, and ancient history must be wrong. That's a professing Christian writing there. And I would like to think that that's an obscure voice among professing Christians, but it's not. And I'm not going to take the time to go into more quotations. But many, if not most scientists, secular scientists included, believe that an ancient cataclysmic event impacted the earth upon which we live. That's not really disputed among scientists. I was looking for an article that was written in, I think it was the year 2000, and it was published in the, in the L.A. Times, but I couldn't find the original article, so I, didn't, I was going to quote from it. But it was an article on this very subject that something happened within 8,000 years ago, cataclysmic, that affected this earth. Scientists believe this. They're unco- That's one of the explanations to things that they're finding on this earth. And so the evidence is overwhelming that something happened. The questions are what, who, and why. Naturalists look for answers with no connection to a creator. By observation, they seek to find answers purely in the natural realm. And I'm not creating a straw man here to beat the straw man up. I am simply being honest. And every, any naturalist will tell you that, what I just said. They assume there is no one guiding or, contr- or controlling anything. Even though evidence screams design and thus a designer, the naturalist rules that possibility out. The supernaturalists interpret what they see by the light of the Word of God and find answers that fit the evidence and explain the who and why that science will never answer conclusively. You see, here's one thing that's true about all supernaturalists. We walk by faith, not by sight. And it's because we believe that we are convinced. It is by faith that we understand that the worlds were made by the Word of God. It's critical. But God has recorded something in His Word for every generation since that time. And it's the record of the flood and the ark, and they are given in sufficient detail. Some might say, we need more detail. We have every detail God intends for us to have. And we have just enough. And we really don't need more details than what God has given to make the point that God intends to make for the world. Even 4,000 years later, It's one of the things I appreciated about a a comment that A.W. Pink made. He said, 4,000 years later, God's Word is still speaking. And 
And these things have been recorded for us and preserved for us so that we might know the truth about God. God is serious about revealing Himself to us through this record. And if you're of the mindset that you want to skip the Old Testament and race to the New Testament because you find the New Testament to be a, a cozier, friendlier place to dwell then I'm telling you, you are skipping over the very nature of God revealed in the Old Testament. That is also confirmed in the New Testament. And if you have come to Jesus, so to speak, and yet have skipped over the Old Testament, one of these days you're going to read the Old Testament and you're going you're to have a problem with God. Because you're not going to like some of the things you read. But God has revealed Himself to us in all of this Scripture. And I like what Russell Moore, who is from Southern Seminary in Kentucky, said this. So many, and he said this in recent, I don't remember exactly, I don't, didn't write the date down, but recently, so many evangelical children's Sunday school classes are translating biblical text into a baptized version of Mr. Rogers' neighborhood of make-believe. Jesus' calling of the twelve is about the fact that Jesus had friends. Jesus' multiplication of the loaves and of the fish is about the idea that Jesus wants you to share. Noah's Ark is now about responsible care of pets. The children are then called on to emulate the biblical characters in being good boys and girls. Previous generations had a term for Bible study like this. It was called Protestant liberalism. And in case we don't remember, it didn't lead to anything good. God wants us to know that He is grieved over sin. God wants us to know that He will not overlook sin. Genesis 6, verses 5 and 6, you can read it. We won't take time to read it today. We looked at it last week. But God saw. God is still seeing. He's still looking upon this earth. And it's recorded for us that we might know it. And it's recorded in graphic terms, in terms we can relate to the destruction. As overwhelming as that destruction was in the flood, we can, it's a, something we can tangibly relate to because we've experienced local flooding. And God wants us to relate to it. God wants us to know that He is so disturbed, grieved over sin that He said, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh wherein is the breath of life from under heaven and everything that is in the earth shall die. This wasn't Satan's activity. This was God's doing. I, even I, He says. And He doesn't sweep this into some, into some archaic writings uh, reserved in some monastery somewhere. He has written it and preserved it for you, for anyone to see it and has moved His people over the years to translate this into multiple languages, and we're still translating, trying to get this message into every tongue in the world. God doesn't want this hidden. He wants you to know who He is. But He also wants you to know that there is a place of rest, there is a place of shelter, there is a comfort from the storm of His wrath. He is long-suffering and He wants you to know that. And it's demonstrated in the account of Noah and the ark by God preserving the world and humanity that He created here we are, 4,000 years later, and this thing is still rolling. Earth is still here, humanity is still here, and iniquity is abounding. It's still here. Long-suffering. 
before bringing attention to the salvation of the Lord so vividly typified by the ark, let me briefly address a few practical problems that some have raised in objection to a literal Noah's ark. And I say briefly. I don't want to take more than five minutes here because I want the bulk of my time to deal with the, 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 the ark as a type of Christ. And Noah's relationship to that ark is a type of Christ. I want to press the gospel home to you today. The question is asked, can such a, an ark withstand a deluge? I've read statements of those who study these matters that say the size and shape of the ark was designed for floating, not sailing. And would have been very difficult to capsize. In fact, I read some folks who said it was the perfect shape and size to withstand a deluge that came. But here's what I read in the book of Genesis. In chapter 8 and verse 4, And the ark rested in the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. That's enough for me. It did withstand the flood. I don't have to know how or why. I don't have to answer all those questions. And maybe you have a more inquiring mind. And if you do, I would say talk to Jeremy. He has one of those minds too. And he has more information than I do about these things. I think there's probably some videos back there too, aren't there, in the, in the library. How can millions of animal species fit into an ark 75 feet wide, 450 feet long, 45 feet high, approximate measurements of the ark? Well, kind, the word kind is important in the King James. It refers to those that are within that particular gene pool which can be reproduced. In fact, the Scripture says they produced after their kind. And that's what's being referred to. And so, according to Morris and Whitcomb's commentary on the Genesis Flood, authorities on biological taxonomy estimate that there are less than 18,000 species of animals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians living in the world today. This number might be double to allow for known extinct land animals, that is, those known from actual fossil records, not the imaginary transitional forms that never existed except in the minds of evolutionists. And so the record of Scripture fits the math. In fact, there's no miracle involved here. People will say, how do the millions of animals that needed to be on that ark get on the ark? ark there weren't millions of animals. They suggest at the most 35,000. And once you go see a replica up in Kentucky, it kind of makes sense how it could be done. It sort of visualizes it for you. You can see pictures online, I'm sure. So in other words, that wasn't something. That's something that we can even demonstrate just practically, scientifically. You don't need to say God performed a miracle there on that one. How did the animals all get caught? You ever wondered that? How did the animals all get caught? Well, in Genesis 1, the animal, God brought the animals to Adam to name them. Genesis chapter 6 says, Two of every sort shall come unto thee to keep them alive. God brought the animals to Noah. I'm okay with that, are you? <laughs> You see, I'm not being extremely complicated here. You see, here's, here's, here's the bottom line. I was going to ask, what about food, water, sewer, hygiene, blah, 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 blah. There's a whole lot of questions you can ask. And there are answers to those things. But here's the deal. I don't care what answer I give. If you're an unbeliever, you will be an unbeliever still. I will never scientifically convince you to come to Christ. I will never be able to give you new birth by answering all of your skeptical questions. If you get all of your questions answered today, you're going to wake up tomorrow with another question. And if you get that one answered, there's going to be another one. Because you don't even know all the questions to ask. And the more information you get, the more questions come. And faith answers those questions, you see. Faith says, I believe God. And if you have that kind of faith, 
then you are likely one that has the faith of the Son of God in you. That must be exercised, and that's what we see in the life of Noah, don't we? We see faith being exercised. Peter says this, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. The just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. I believe that's referring to the preaching that was done by Noah in Noah's day as he built the ark. Those that were now in prison were preached to in that day which sometime were disobedient. That's the response of the world that heard Noah preaching in that day. They were disobedient. They were filled with skepticism. They did not believe what Noah was saying. When once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a-preparing, wherein few, that's an important uh, phrase there, wherein, wherein what? In the ark. And here's what I'm seeking to show. I've asked the question, why do we say the ark is a type of Christ? Who gave us the right to say that? Because when I started thinking of the ark as a type of Christ, and I started reading Genesis, and I started trying to figure out what is, what is the, what are we supposed to learn from this? I I began to come up with things that didn't seem to fit, didn't make sense, and I'm, I'm thinking, who gives me the right to say that the ark is a type of Christ? And what I'm saying is Peter does, or the Holy Spirit does through Peter. Because he says, wherein few, that is eight souls were saved by water. Wherein? In the ark. Not in the water. In the ark. The souls were saved. The like figure. So there's a corresponding message. There's something being typified. There's something being proclaimed in that which is going on with Noah and the ark and the flood. Water was certainly involved. Did water save anybody in the flood? Water drowned everybody in the flood. Does that ever ever cross your mind when you read this passage? Because it says, eight souls were saved by water. The word by there is a translation of a Greek word that could be translated by, it could be translated through. In other words, it could be speaking instrumentally, the water was what saved, or it's the, or it's the, the sphere in which the salvation took place. And I think that's the idea here. Because he says, the like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, So he's not talking about the water. He's talking about what is typified as you go into the water. What you are typifying is that you're in the ark. You're in Christ. And the water doesn't drown you. The the water, it's in the context of that water that you are manifesting something. You are demonstrating something. It's an answer of a good conscience before God. Why didn't Noah go into that ark? Because he believed God. The ark preceded the water. Christ precedes the water. Christ precedes baptism. And so there's a picture. And he says, wherein the like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto Him, for as much then as Christ also hath suffered. You see, in the context, He is lifting up the suffering, risen Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and He's saying, He's the key to your salvation. But Peter reaches back to the time of the flood, and he points to the ark as a type, as a figure. Now let's go back to Acts or excuse me, Genesis chapter 6. And on the basis of Peter's words, we conclude that the ark is representative of Jesus Christ. 
I want you to note a few things in passing before I get to what I really want to press. In verses 14 through 16 of Genesis, you'll see the description given. And there are things that I'm sure that can be brought out that I'm not bringing out in this message. It would take too long. But you'll notice that the ark had a window that was above. And I think that typifies that Jesus came down from heaven. He came down from above. The ark is Christ. Christ came down from above. And that's a huge point that Jesus makes in the Gospel of John, right? John records over and over again, I came down from heaven. I came down from above. And so the window on top of the ark is... is, is typifying that He came down, but it also is typifying that light is from Him, and in Him we have access to God who is above. It's through Jesus Christ. The ark has one door on the side. And I tried to make sense of that. I thought, well, you know, Jesus is the, the only way. But that didn't really fit in my mind because if Jesus is the ark, the door is the way into the ark. So how could the door be talking about I am the door? I am possibly that's 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 true. But what came to my mind is there is only one access into Jesus Christ, and that is repentance and faith. And we're going to make much of that here in a few moments. The only way you get into Christ is repentance and faith. You're you're brought into Christ. There's an effectual call that comes to you. And you respond to that call. And into Christ you go. Experientially. The ark was pitched. Verse 14 says, Pitch it within and without with pitch. It's interesting that that word pitch... The King James translates it pitch. It is also translated, most of the time when it's used in the Old Testament, it's translated atonement. Interesting. Atonement or a covering. A covering from the wrath of God. Within and without, the ark was pitched. Does this not point forward to the atonement of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus Christ shed for our sins. The blood of Jesus Christ, the satisfying atonement that answers to the just wrath of God against the deepest unrighteousness of sinners. So if you're in Christ, there is a pitch that pitches. There is a covering that you have. And the wrath of God cannot, will not touch you. Touch you. Being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Romans 5 and verse 9. And so we should, we should view Noah's relation to the ark as a picture to us of our relationship to Jesus Christ in the day of final judgment. And I think that's what Noah's... Salvation is a, a broad subject. I believe that Noah and the ark is specifically focusing upon our relationship to God in Christ in the face of judgment. The judgment of God. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. He's talking about judgment. And Jesus is saying, look back at the ark. And as you look forward to the day of the Son of Man, as you look forward to the judgment that has been promised, think about the ark. Think about Noah in relationship to the ark. What Jesus is really saying is, think about me. You need me. God called Noah into the ark. Chapter 7, verse 1. The Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. And that's, that's a significant expression. It's used again in 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 chapter 6, in this generation, God looked at Noah. And in this generation, in relationship to the generation in which he lived, God saw him to be a certain way. Noah stood out in his generation as one who walked with God. He's called a righteous man, a just man, a perfect, an upright man in chapter 6 and verse 9. And yet, listen to this, and yet... The only way that he would live through this coming storm of judgment was by coming into the ark.
Do you see the significance of that? His works of righteousness would not deliver him from God's holy wrath. Noah was still a sinner in need of a Savior. Without the ark, he would have perished. Which was evident after the flood. I mean, you read only a chapter or two later, and what happens to Noah? He gets drunk. Noah, he's described as an upright man, a righteous man, a just man in his generation. But he was still a sinner. And he needed a Savior. And in the face of the holy, just judgment of God against sin and sinners, he needed a protection which he did not have in himself. And so the ark was prepared because Noah needed a Savior. It must be entered. God called Noah into the ark. And listen to me. According to chapter, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 19, remember who preached unto the spirits which are now in prison. They were preached to. God calls Noah, but that generation was preached to. There was a general call, a general warning that went out to all. And those who did not listen, they heard, but they didn't listen. Oh, listen to God, please. Listen to God if you hear... This morning, you, some of you, many of you have grown up under the truth. You, you know the truth, but you haven't listened. Listen to God. Listen to the Spirit of Christ through the preaching of the warnings of Scripture. It's not enough that you are righteous. It's not enough that you're upright. It's not enough that you even think you walk with God. Our own righteousness and our own acts of worship will never deliver us from the wrath to come. I'm glad you're here this morning. But this is not going to earn you a spot, a safe place in the day of God's wrath. Sitting in these chairs here is not going to get you into a place of safety. God said, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. Well, God, I'm good. You, you said I'm right. You said I'm just and upright. Don't you know who I am? I, I don't need that. Oh, yes, you do, Noah. Come thou and all thy house into the ark. And what does Jesus say? What does Jesus say? Can you hear Jesus saying it? Can you hear Him? Come unto me. Can you hear Him? Come unto me. Come unto me. And through His apostle... You hear Him say, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. Interesting. This last week when I read that, I still cried that out in prayer to God. God, my house isn't saved yet. Is your house saved? Have you come in, but your house hasn't? Come thou and thy house into the ark. And as God's long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, He has mercifully extended time. The door of the ark is, is still open today. Today, it's still open. But it will not be open forever. It will be shut. Noah was not only called into the ark, Noah entered the ark. Verse 7, incredibly important words. Verse 7, and Noah went in. <laughs> Noah, Noah went in. I know. I know the Bible clearly tells us Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In chapter 6 and verse 8. And that is the reason why he differed from the rest of humanity. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, it wasn't anything in Noah. Noah, God, grace is not dependent on you and me. It's dependent on God. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We know that apart from God's intervening grace, he would have walked by sight, 
not faith. He would have worn out. He would have gotten tired. He would not have made it that hundred plus years in making and building that ark. And he would have perished with all the rest. But God's call to Noah was effectual. Grace ultimately made him to differ. We know that, and we know even to this day, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. We know that there is an effectual call that goes out to those that God has chosen. We, we believe that. That's the grace of God. But do not miss this. Noah exercised faith that led him to enter the ark at God's bidding. And had he not exercised that faith, had he not entered that ark, he would have perished. And think about what that meant for him to exercise that faith, which was faith in God, and he exercised it by coming into the ark. That's what you do when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You are exercising that faith. But think about what that meant for Noah. He turned away from the sinful generation of his day who mocked the Word of God, living in sin. Think about it. Here he was alone, his family and of course, Methuselah just died recently. Perhaps there were other family members who were believing. I don't know. We don't, we're not given all the details. But here he was, knowing that, it's, that for him to walk onto that ark, you know what that meant. It meant a separation from the rest of the world. It meant turning his back on the world. It meant being crucified to the world and the world to him. It meant something. What I'm describing is repentance. And he did that. He turned away from his sinful generation who mocked the Word of God, who continued living in sin and corruption. And going into the ark, he was separated from the rest of the world. Noah could not have exercised faith going into the ark without turning from the world. Anybody who says that you can exercise faith in the Lord Jesus Christ without turning from the world does not understand biblical faith. Repentance and faith must be exercised by every person responding to the call of God in the gospel. It is true. We are chosen in Christ by grace before the foundation of the world. Ephesians tells us that. But election is unto salvation. It is not the Savior. You don't come into election. You come into Christ. And if you remain in love with this world, you will perish along with the world. I think there are some people who are thinking that election is their Savior. And they're thinking, well, if it's going to be, it's going to be. I'll just uh, roll the dice and hope He chose me. That's not the message of Scripture. You've got to come into the ark. God says so. Come thou in all thy house into the ark. And Noah went in. Entering Jesus... By faith means then that you leave the world and its sinful lust to trust in and follow Jesus. And when you come into Jesus Christ, our ark, you see the glory of the cross of Jesus and you experience death to the world and the world to you. And the spell of this world is broken. The spell of this world is broken. And so that you can live like the Apostle Paul lived, dying daily, dying to this world, not controlled by this world, knowing that everything that you do enjoy in this world is passing away. And so you hold it loosely as you hold on to Christ. You enjoy every good and uh, perfect gift that comes from your Father, which is, from a, which is above, and you enjoy everything that He has created. You see things in this world that the unregenerate eye doesn't see. And there is an enjoyment and there is a, a pleasure that God has given to us. That's, we're not discounting any of those things. But what we're saying is those things no longer hold you, grip you. 
if you hear God saying to you, come thou and thy house into the ark, then come. And if you come, your relationship to this world will forever be changed. Then notice what happened when they went into the ark. Chapter 7 and verse 16. They that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Oh, that's good. The Lord opens a door that no man can shut, and he shuts a door no man can open. You know, you know who holds the key to death and hell? It, we're talking about the authority and power of God to keep his people right here. The Lord shot him in. Noah was secure. He was trusting God. He was acting in faith. He was, he was turning away from everything that was contrary to that which God had shown to him. And he came into the ark. He trusted God's provision. He didn't have to have all kinds of scientific evidence. To, the, the rest of the world needed that. Prove to us that a flood's coming. Well, you know, it's possible that it could come. And, you know, the, 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 here I go trying to talk scientific, and I'm not even going to try. But, you know, and, 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 the, and it just leads to more questions and more mocking, more skepticism. But, but Noah believed God. He trusted God. He believed what God said would happen, and he acted upon that. He trusted God in the face of the unknown. There's things about the future we don't know, but we know what God has said. And that's what we place our confidence in, what God has said. And if God has commanded, we obey, we listen, we respond. That's what faith is. And God shut him in. In chapter 8, verse 1, it says, God remembered Noah. He remembered those that were in the ark. He remembers those who are in Christ. You say, well, God knows everything. Yes, this is something different. This is something more intimate. This is something closer. He remembered them. His children. The ones who are in His Son. In Christ. And God preserved them. Chapter 8, verses 15 through 19. I'll not read those verses, but He said to them at the... You know, when the flood subsided, the door was open. He says, go forth. And I suppose we could preach a message about going into all the world and preaching the gospel or something there, but it certainly is a picture. But he says, go forth. Every single one who was on that ark was preserved. What are we saying? We're saying, here is hope. Here is hope. For all who are in Christ by faith, here is hope. The wrath of God is forever satisfied in Jesus Christ. He's the one as our ark who, who was exposed to the torrential outpouring of the wrath of God. And He consumed it all. He took it upon Himself. And if you're in Him, you don't feel it. It doesn't come to you. You're preserved from that. You're kept by God in the ark. He remembers you. He knows you. Forever. Isn't that what Peter said? And we're in, we've been in 1 Peter a lot this morning, but uh, we were there in the last hour. 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the Lord, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Of course, you know Romans chapter 8. Nothing can separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. 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 You say, what about my sin? Especially your sin. Jesus bore that on the cross. Your guilt is gone. There is no condemnation. Ever. For those who are in Christ Jesus, God shuts you in. Does that sound like security to you? God shuts you in. 
I had, I've had people say to me, well, I don't, I'm not sure about believing in Jesus. I'm not sure I can continue to the end. And my response to them is, you can't, but God can, and God does. You come into the ark, He shuts you in. He preserves you unto the end. One more thought. Talking about the ark. Talking about Noah's relationship to the ark. Go to chapter 5, Genesis chapter 5. This has to do with the name, the person who was actually in that ark. I hope I'm not stretching things too much here, but. In chapter 5, verse 28, And Lamech lived 180 and two years and begat a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, The same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord had cursed. He called his name Noah. The same shall comfort us. Noah, rest, comfort. That's what his name means. Where was Noah? He was in the ark. Rest, comfort. Noah was in the ark as judgment came. And what was in the ark? Rest and comfort was in the ark. And I see that to be a picture to us of what we have in Christ in the face of judgment. If you're in Christ Jesus, if you're in, if you're in the ark, Noah's in the ark. Rest and comfort is in the ark. And you have that. And you have good reason. You have God-given reason that rest and comfort should possess your soul at the thought of coming judgment. Judgment is coming. In 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1, whenever you think of Noah in the ark, think of rest and comfort in Christ Jesus. And this is what you should have in Christ Jesus, rest and comfort. It should be in all who are also in Christ. 1 Thessalonians, chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And notice in verse 6. Seeing it is a righteous thing that God, with God, to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Joshua, there's relates. And to you who are troubled, rest. That's not a verb, that's a noun. And to you who are troubled, rest. That's what you have in Christ, is rest. Rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels, what's He, what's he doing? In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the, from the glory of His power. Rest. You understand what's going on here? When Christ comes, when vengeance comes, when that flaming sword, that fire is poured out, the fire of God's vengeance against sin and sinners is poured out, if you're in Christ, you have nothing to be troubled over. Rest for you. When He shall come to be glorified in His saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed, in that day, chapter 5 of this same, excuse me, back in chapter 5 of the previous epistle, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So in the face of judgment, we who are in Christ have rest and comfort in the ark, in Jesus Christ. The flood of God's fiery fury has not yet been unleashed. But it will be. I know preachers have been saying that ever since I was a little kid. I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to get my driver's license and drive before Jesus came. 
I was afraid I wasn't going to graduate from high school. I was afraid I was not going to get married. I was afraid I was going to, you know, I was afraid about a lot of things. Isn't that crazy, the things that you're afraid of? Afraid of not being able to get some things accomplished. Jesus was going to come. It was going to end. Because when I was younger, people used to talk more about the coming of Jesus. Have you noticed that we don't talk about that much anymore? Because he ain't really coming, is he? See, we've allowed the mock mockers and the skeptics to sort of have a, an effect on us. We've allowed science to have an effect on us. We've allowed worldly philosophy. We've allowed attachments to the world. We've allowed a lot of things to have an effect on us. Listen, Jesus is coming. And when He comes, we read about that flaming, fiery sword. He is coming. And He'll be coming in judgment. And you can ignore the warning and go about life as if there's nothing to be feared, just like it was in the days, days of Noah. Until it started raining. And still the, until the grounds opened up. Like, what is happening? Noah was right. And he's safe. But as I said last week, they weren't saying, let me in. They were cursing the God who was sending the judgment. You say, how do you know that? Read it in Revelation. So you can ignore the warning and go about life as if there's nothing to be feared. You can think about Jesus Christ and admire Him from a distance. That's a great ark, Noah. What a masterpiece. I kind of like that. I, that's, a, that's a great design. That sounds really good. Boy, that was a great message. But I'm not coming in. I don't believe. Or, you can repent of your sin, and you can come out of the world and into the ark, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I'm calling you to today. I'm calling you to repent of your sin and come to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not telling you to come to Jesus Christ with your own developed thoughts of who you think He is. I'm saying come to Him as He is, on His terms. Come to Him. There's only one ark. You can't make your own boat and get by. There's only one ark. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's his, it's as, as He's revealed Himself in this book. And I'm going to close with just one final thought. Because there may be somebody here who's disturbed about something that I said earlier. God's a monster. And you sat there thinking, ooh, how could anybody say that? And yet, if you're honest, it's bothered you to imagine some little child floating around in a deluge. And if it hadn't bothered you, I don't know if you're human. It ought to bother you. And so I'm going to give this one final thought. For any who may be battling thoughts of accusation against God, and wondering how He could do such a thing to those whom He created, I would just suggest to you, and this is not a complicated answer, I would suggest to you to learn from Noah, a true worshiper of God, who lived by faith, he was there. Don't, don't miss that point. He was there. This is some mythological figure. Noah was a human being just like you are a human being. He was there. And when he went in that ark, if he believed God and he did, he's the evidence as he did, he knew what happened. And when he came off, what did he see? I, I don't know what all he saw, but it was desolate. There were no humans. They were gone. His neighbors, extended family members, gone. That was real. The devastation of the worldwide judgment wasn't something that he just read about. He experienced it. He was there. And what did he do when he came off the ark? Chapter 8, verse 20. Open altar. 
He worshiped God, built an altar unto the Lord, and offered of the, of the sweet-smelling savor to the Lord, which the apostle tells us is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Worship is the response of repenting, believing sinners before God. Worship. Not, how could you, God? Not, you got something to explain to me, God. No, it's amazing grace. How sweet the sound saved a wretch like me. But for the grace of God, but for an amazing Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, but for that repentance and faith that swelled within me, I would have been just like those swallowed up in the flood of God's wrath. May God help you. May there be such a work done in your heart today that you would be able to worship God even at the thought of judgment, but especially at the thought of Christ. And Father, it is in His name that we bow before You.